Hey everybody, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. On this show, we go behind the scenes of some of the world's most customer-centric companies. And one of these companies is Build-A-Bear Workshop. Build-A-Bear was on the forefront of creating an experience. They are definitely an experiential company. And to talk about their digital transformation and so much more is Sharon Price John, the president and CEO of Build-A-Bear Workshop. She has a new book coming out called Stories and Heart, a compilation of stories on overcoming adversity and finding success. Sharon has a ton of retail experience working at Hasbro and Mattel. In this episode, we're talking about build bears digital transformation and things that you all are thinking about all the time. How do we measure customer experience in this new digital world? How do we create a customer-centric culture? And today we have a CEO to tell you about all things customer experience. Please enjoy Sharon Price John. Sharon, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. Where are you calling in from today? From St. Louis. Wonderful. Well, you look so cozy right now for our listeners who can't see you. You've got all of your beautiful red books. In fact, I'm wearing red, which is a complete accident. So I match your background. It's amazing. Well, that's wonderful. And don't claim it's an accident. Own okay. it. Yeah. Land it. This is just outstanding, you know, preparation. Well, red, you know, and research. It's- Red is all about, it's warmth, it's love, it's a power color. Like, I'm all about red. I need to get more red. (laughs) Um, So today we're talking about your new book, Stories and Heart, and we're talking about digital transformation and the work that you're doing at Build-A-Bear. So let's just get started with a little bit about your background for our audience that don't know you. You've worked at Hasbro, uh, StrideRite, Mattel, Barbie. I mean, you have a lot of experience. Can you just talk about why you chose to take the career trajectory that you did? Uh, Well, the trajectory was not my choice. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, uh, but the, cho- the the decisions within which companies and what type of uh, organizations and what the categories were, that was my choice. So um, I actually started my, uh, my career in the advertising industry um, right out of college. I went to the University of Tennessee undergrad, which is uh, the same uh, state from which I uh, hail. And um, shortly thereafter, went to New York to work in the ad industry. And um, this is I, some by, somewhat by choice and somewhat by accident. I ended up working on some kids' brands in the confections business. So on the Hershey business and the M&M, M&M Mars business. And, um, and I had a real uh, natural pinch it to be able to think like a kid. So uh, that was a great interest to me. And I also like to do things that are fun. Um, and always wanted to be in a place that I loved and doing things that I loved. Um, so after I went back and got my MBA from Columbia, um, I was looking at a lot of the different companies and types of companies that were coming to campus to interview. And, you know, most of the things that folks do, you know, after they graduate from a, a, like a, you know, a top 10 program like Columbia, they're usually going into banking or, um, you know, venture capital or management consulting or things like that. And I looked into that for a moment, particularly on the marketing side of management consulting. But at the end of the day, I really wanted something that was more consumer facing, um, brand building, kid, kid centric. So I made this short list of companies and Mattel was on that list. So that's how I ended up in the toy industry was getting my job at Mattel uh, in California, moving cross country. Um, And I was very insistent, not that they had to do this, but very insistent that I work on Barbie because it was one of my favorite toys as a kid. And they were kind enough to give me a position on Barbie fashions, which for me was a dream come true. Um, And then my toy industry, I stayed in the toy industry after that with Mattel for five years, a little bit of time at VTech, then over to Hasbro where I was a, worked my way up to be the um, general manager and senior vice president of the U.S. toy division, about a billion dollar division with all sorts of household brands that you, everyone knows from, you know, Transformers to My Little Pony to Littlest Pet Shop to Nerf. Um, and then um, even took the global preschool job, which would include Play School and things like um, Play-Doh or 
Mr. Potato Head, things everyone knows about, and Stride Right called. So that was my uh, that was my step aside for a moment, but still in the kids space um, to be in the fashion footwear industry. But I learned specialty retail there. All those companies that I mentioned beforehand. They, um, you know, we sell to big box retailers. You know, you learn a lot about that, but it's not vertical. Vertical retail is very different, operates very differently. So I knew how to, you know, source from China because that's what we do or Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, that's what the toy industry, 95% of all toys come from Southeast Asia. About that last time I looked. Um, and um, same with fashion and foot, or mostly footwear. Um, but that, so I didn't learn that and I didn't learn kids and I didn't learn moms and kids marketing, but that vertical retail piece was missing. And that's exactly what Build-A-Bear is. So that was like a missing piece for me to be, you know, a really valid candidate for the CEO position when, um, when someone knocked on my door. So since you have so much experience in retail and especially in this specific niche of kids, let's step back before we get into what you're doing now to just talk about customer experience with all that rich experience in retail. Can you just tell our listeners, what does customer experience mean to you? How would you define it? Uh, well, for Build-A-Bear, uh, it is uh, so much of the, it just woven into the DNA of who we are and what we are. I mean, so much of why Build-A-Bear exists is because of outs- an outstanding vision of an elevated consumer experience um, by the founder, Maxine Clark. I mean, that is what we do. We mm-hmm. don't, you know, at the end of the process, do you then purchase something that is a, you know, a furry friend or a teddy bear? Yes, but that's not what the entire transaction's about, right? It's about someone creating uh, in the empowerment uh, for a child, a teen, an adult, anyone to come in and end up with something that's uniquely theirs um, and not simply from the stuffing of it or the heart ceremony or the amazing personality traits that they may want, might want to imbue onto this, you know, new teddy bear, for example, but the way they dress it, what they name it through the birth certificate, you know, creating a birth certificate process and the name process. Um, but they can also put their own sound in there, like their own personal voice in there or the voice of someone else. I mean, it's an incredibly unique experience. And so we have an incredibly high standard, obviously, of what um, customer experience means and um, user experience even on our website. And, um, you know, that was actually one of the hurdles that we had when we started to really seriously explore a fair um, a, a fair participation in the digital economy. You know, what what were the different ways that we could meet consumers where they are um, through different uh, purchasing venues um, whenever and however they wanted to do that. So we actually had to create sort of a, uh, a different way of a filter for ourselves uh, because I believe that when we first went into that, we were thinking that the customer experience the, the, the high standard that we have needed to be completely replicated, but our guests weren't really even asking for that online. So mm-hmm. that was like a, a, a re, um, rethinking for our own, you know, from our own perspective, but using this customer centric feedback as a, a strong um, metric of how we made those decisions. Yeah, and if you think about Build-A-Bear, you are already using so many of the tenets of customer experience as we know it today. Like now in a store, it's not really about your inventory. It's Your store is almost a showroom, an experience center. What can you teach the customer? What do they see, smell, hear, feel? It's much different. I mean, in a way, the world is so much different, but I think Build-A-Bear lends itself so nicely to some of the trends today. So let's just talk about the digital transformation of Build-A-Bear. You know, clearly the in-store experience is very strong. And you talked about talking to the customer and learning some things that you were really counterintuitive. So could you just talk about the digital transformation and what it looked like? Right. Um, So Build-A-Bear was, I would say that we were a pioneer uh, in that early, really highly engaging retail tainment's another word for it, mm-hmm. um, physical experience 
um, where, you know, it's that the relationship is m- much, much more than transactional, right? Right. Um, and it was all of that that created the brand. I mean, those stores and everything that goes on in those stores are the w- the reason why we have such personal relationships with our guests um, and why we create memories and mark those moments in time. And we were really uh, conscientious of that when we wanted to take our online experience, buildabear.com, to something that was more than in the beginning, it was being used not dissimilar the way a lot of other, and I'm all the way back in the early 2000s here, uh, before my time of, you know, maybe just a way to manage inventory or, you know, deal with excess inventory or something like that. But we're like, no, we we need to rethink this. And um, we did, just like with everything else we do, we have these tenants of um, where we use a filter of brand building, um, consumer centric data and data driven. Mm-hmm. So BBCCDD. So we went back to that basic idea of how we think through things. Is this on brand? Does it serve the consumer? And is it fact based? Right. Um, of, we had a much uh, looser definition of how people wanted to engage with us online than what was be the expectation in stores. And some of that is because of the different purposes that that online uh, that online transaction was going to service. What we were d- discovering, given that we were becoming multi-generational, is there was um, a lot of uh, teens and adults that are starting to re-engage with our brand, many of whom most likely had purchased you know, products from us as children and had incredible affinity for the brand. And they were collecting Build-A-Bear or, um, you know, just a super fan of Build-A-Bear or really liked some of our licensing that we were doing. So they may have been a fan of, you know, Pokemon and a fan of Build-A-Bear or a fan of How to Train Your Dragon or Toothless and a fan of Build-A-Bear. So they wanted all of these things together. Um, For a lot of those guests, it wasn't necessarily about the experience anymore. That singular experience that they had had created an indelible brand relationship. They wanted the product in the way that they're used to buying in so many ways. So we had to develop a multidimensional website. And what I mean by that is different stages and ways um, that are kind of levels of engagement. Mm -hmm. So that particular guest wanted it mobile first, frictionless, fewest clicks as possible. They just wanted their next Pokemon. You Mm -hmm. know, they didn't want to go through a process. They didn't want to have to pick all this stuff. And we created bundles so they could literally, you know, it comes out there on my loyal, you know, loyalty list. They're on the Pokemon. They've clicked the Pokemon thing. So we're sending that out. They and they turn that around really quickly. They just want their next Pokemon. It's fine. It's all so because they've already created that affinity with us. And there are plenty of people online from the gifting perspective who want to create something unique. So we kind of created something called a that's sim- more similar to our process called the Bear Builder Configurator, where you can pick the bear, then pick an outfit, then put a sound in it. Then and it has a lot of different layers, but that takes some dedication of time to get it that personalized. But there are consumers that want to do that, but don't believe they need to go into the store to do that. That's great. Then we created something called Bear Builder 3D, which is a child's version of um, how to bring, almost bring the Build-A-Bear experience to life um, in live, a kind of a, a cartoon um, virtual reality VR light you know, it's meant to be a side-by-side experience with a, a caregiver. But literally, the, the furry friend comes to life when you put the heart in it. Oh, and wow. then they go to a, a closet and you kind of pick out the clothes. And you, you know, it's really, really, really cute and fun. Um, but very close to something that would feel almost like a video game. Okay. Um, so, you know, we have lots of ways to engage. Then we have different sections of the website like the bear cave that is designed for that older consumer where we we sell our um, some of our more uh, like maybe licenses based on R-rated films. Mm-hmm. So and when you say R-rated film, what are you talking about? But right, right, right. Um, bear what? No, but, you know, Matrix bear <laughs> and right, Deadpool right, right. bear and stuff like that okay. um, that people love because it's such it's so tongue in cheek or some of the. 
um, sitcoms like uh, from you know a few years past, like Friends, which has had a massive resurgence, or The Office. You know, that's really not designed for little kids. Um, but they come into the bear cave, and it's age gated, so it's a nice, safe place. Um, but you can kind of peruse all these, you know, kind of funny, off, yeah, edgy. What we we call it the bear cave because one, that's funny, but two, at like a cave, it's a little bit darker and a little bit cooler. You know, is this like, online? This is online. Online only. Yeah, yeah. online. So, so you can come in and do that. Then we have Heart Box is a subsite. Um, where you can come in and it's a procured already giftable box. Everything's already chosen for you. Uh, really high end art heart box bear, maybe some, a candle, some tea, you mm-hmm. know, things that are kind of just this wonderful gift for specific occasions already themed out. Or you can come into the pajama shop and buy some family pajamas. So was this all pre-COVID set up or this was during COVID when customers couldn't come into your stores anymore? Um, a lot of those things had already been set up pre-COVID, um, but um, we accelerated the digital transformation during COVID that be- uh-huh. because it was pipelining. Um, uh, we already had some of the basics in place. That the, one of the big unlocks was actually that we were uh, able to flip a switch and activate against buy online ship from store, buy online pick up in store after our store started to open up, but people were still kind of afraid to just get out there in the crowds right. and shop. Right. Um, and that had to do with, we dropped in a new inventory management system in February of 2020, believe it or not. Oh, wow. And yeah, and without that kind of perfect real-time inventory, you cannot deploy um, orders to the store level because you don't know what's there or what's not. Mm-hmm. And we created an algorithm to get it you know, closer to the end user, and our bear builders stayed busy by us sending those online orders out to our 300-some-odd little, little mini fulfillment center warehouses now that we were not using in that way prior to COVID. Let's talk about measurement. This is a really big topic with every business person all over the world right now. How do you measure customer experience? You are very involved in the customer strategy. Uh, What is your recommendation to other business people who are listening that want some of the success that you've had? How How would you recommend we measure customer experience in this new, more complicated digital world? Yeah, that's a great question. And we have a tremendous amount of um, access to very specific metrics, um, particularly as it relates to our relationship with Salesforce, um, Mm -hmm. that we have integrated a lot of our systems and business and loyalty program with that particular um, organization. Um, But, you know, that's just at the very top line. I think that because Build-A-Bear is an emotional brand, um, we get a lot of feedback. <laughs> People really love to tell us their stories, good, bad, or indifferent, and we love mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to hear back from our guests and make sure that we're servicing them appropriately. And then we also do research on a regular basis and, you know, understanding our net uh, net promoter score, what's our current braided, aided and unaided brand awareness, what's the intention, why, you know, what's the next, you know, are you, are, when are you planning to come back? Are you planning to come back? What's keeping you from coming back or why, you know, all of those mm-hmm. things where, uh, we try to our best to stay in touch with our guests concerning that. Now, also being a vertical, um, you know, we have the opportunity to do outreach surveys as well as intercept surveys on on a regular basis to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our guests to our best uh, the best ability that we have. And so, how visible are you with the frontline? Do you go to stores? Do you talk to frontline workers? Do you talk to people in the call center? What does that look like for you as the CEO? Well, absolutely. I mean, I don't know how you run an organization like this without doing that. That the, we we greatly value our store folks. And we have a store right here in our her- headquarters, um, mm-hmm. our BQ. I'm in there on a regular basis, obviously. Um, and talking to uh, guests and, and as well of, on occasion um, because I don't want to like disrupt the process. 
But certainly speaking with what we call our bear builders um, and our, our district managers come in to our headquarters on a regular basis. Um, we just hired three new um, district managers. They were in here getting their orientation and I spent personal time with each of them. Mm -hmm. um, understanding, you know, how they chose Build-A-Bear, what they wanted to do with their careers, where they were headed, you know, and that's just kind of the way we operate. Um, we want people to feel like they are part of our bear family because we believe that um, and that they are the front line to your point, but not just in that sort of technical way. Mm -hmm. they're, they're personally interacting with um with our consumers on a daily basis, making sure that that experience is the very best that it can be. And we need to give them all the tools um, that we can and support to do that because Build-A-Bear's mission is to add a little more heart to life, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that means when a kid comes in on their birthday, I mean, they're too, think about that. Think about how important it was when you got to choose what you wanted to do on your sixth birthday and literally millions of kids choose to come in and, and celebrate their birthday with Build-A-Bear. I mean, we I have a six-year-old right now and a two-year-old, and I know what you're talking about. These things are just so important. We have to make that special. And no matter what we do from a training program, a guidelines program, a checkbox this, if that's not in the heart of that Build-A-Bear to have a sincere passion to do that, then it doesn't matter what we do. So every, we, you know, that, that happiness and desire and passion has to be a part of who we are. People know. Mm -hmm. Kids know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kids yeah. know if yeah. that bear builder cared or not. Okay. I like that. And so how do you get that into the culture? I think that's something a lot of CEOs struggle with. How do you create a customer-centric culture? Well, see, now fortunately for me, Yes, we do our very best to give everyone the tools that they, they can have, and we keep everyone, you know, excited and pumped up. But this culture that we have in so many ways is so beautifully bottom up, it buoys me. Mm -hmm. That's awesome to hear. Um, let's talk about your book, Stories and Heart, for our audience that haven't read the book. Can you just talk about why you wrote the book and, and some of the key themes? Yeah, it was uh, not something that I had, you know, had on some big tick list. You know, someday I'll write a book. It wasn't that. I was actually approached by Forbes to do it. I struggled with it. Um, I was like, I, I really don't want to write a business book. I'm not ready to write some sort of personal. I'm not, I'm a little too private for that. Um, but, you know, there had been some uh, thoughts in the back of my mind, uh, because after I would do speaking engagements or even I, you know, speak in front of, you know, young professionals and, uh, women many times, and they really just so curious about, well, what were you thinking when you did that? Or how did you get over that? Or did you ever, did you ever have self-doubt? You know, have you ever dealt with, you know, whether fear or did you make a mistake or, and all those answers are, of course. Right. And the very idea that they would have somehow in their minds that a, a successful person or someone they deem successful or didn't have those right, is like right. kind of mind boggling. And I'm like, wow, don't we, you know, yourself included, have an obligation to say, look, you know, this is got, not going to be perfect. You know, it's always up and down. It's about, it's not just about what happens to you. It's the narrative you weave around that, which is the subtitle of the book. And um, unlock the power of personal stories to create a life you love. Right. It's really so much about what you accomplish or don't accomplish has just an immense about uh, to do with what's inside of you and how you're perceiving yourself, the, the universe and your universe. Mm -hmm. And the, and I provide a lot of um, stories that are just truly just points in my career and my life that are just used as a catalyst mm -hmm. for no other reason. I'm not trying to tell my story. It's just, this is at this particular moment in my life or at this juncture, here's what happened. And here's what I did with that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I did the right thing and sometimes I didn't, but I got it. I created these tools along the way that would help me 
uh, deal with maybe some negative self-talk or dragging a bunch of baggage around that's not helping you out or how to create your core values or goal setting or are pulling off, you know, some of the the limitations that we put on ourselves when we're trying to dream big and we can't because you automatically drive it through this filter of, but I can't do that. Well, you don't know. Mm-hmm. Write it down and then back. I backed it up with a lot of data, a lot of research okay. um, that some of these things that I had been thinking and doing and that did result in in you know me being being able to move forward in my career, my life. There's some science behind them. So I wanted to share that. Yeah, you're very unique and you came up in the business world at a time when, yeah, there are a lot of uh, male leaders and, you know, you just did your own thing and you're your own person. And I think that's great. Uh, Let's get to know you a little bit better and do some rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Well, gee, you know, I have no idea because I don't know what the questions are. Well, you have the answers though. You'll know the answers. Okay. Okay. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. So first question, what does your morning routine look like? Oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) I, okay. Um, I wake up without, I don't set an alarm. Oh my goodness. No, I just wake up and I'm so, I'm like, yay. I mean, I'm the most annoying morning person. Like ask my husband. I mean, he's always like, dear God, you know, it's like, does something happen? I literally am like, oh my God, it's morning. You know, like I can't wait. Um, And because I have so much to do, I'm so excited about it. But I've learned before I get up, I literally try to lie there and get my head in a gratefulness stance. Mm -hmm. I really do. Yeah. I just, I get all and just, just pumped up until I get it until I'm like almost like tingling. And then I jump out of bed, get my cup of coffee. I usually go for a walk. Um, like I'll try to knock off a mile before, um, I even get started with my day. And during that, I'm not thinking about the day. I'm doing my best to think about nothing. Great. It's sort of my meditation, and then, um, you know, get ready and everything and, you know, hit the ground running. That's it. Do you have a unique leadership hack that helped get you to where you are today? Um, yes. <laughs> and? <laughs> it's all okay. Well, see, I've just answered the question. <laughs> I guess we need to um, read your book to find out. Yeah, no, I don't share it. This is this is new news. I'll share it. what one of okay. the things that I think has been really beneficial to me um, is you know always try to get you know get to know the people that you're leading. Your next level leadership, in my opinion, is not here's my leadership style. Figure it out. It's becoming malleable to meet the needs of of what of your leadership team. Mm-hmm. How can you how can you best Help them be the best them they can be. Mm -hmm. This is not about you. Nothing's about you. And as soon as you can get that out of your head, I mean, you got to be a happy person and all, but this is about everybody else. And to the degree that you can help that, um, and I don't mean like I'm some guru or anything, but I change my style based on the needs of the person I'm managing. Mm -hmm. I love that. All right. What do you do to relax at the end of a hectic day? Um, well, sometimes it, you know, I've, if I've exercised and if I've, you know, done all those things and gotten my head straight, um, that kind of day is less hectic than one might think. There's busy and there's distracting. Mm -hmm. And those two things are different. Busy's fun. And busy is actually energizing when you are active doing things that are moving things in the right direction, right? So, and you just got, that stuff's got to just roll off. Um, But, you know, I also enjoy a nice glass of wine, but I'll do that even after a non-hectic day. Mm -hmm. All right. (laughs) Sounds good. What is your favorite leadership book or resource? Oh, I have so many. Uh, That is unfair. I will use (laughs) one that I talk about in the book. That Mm -hmm. was a a real uh, game, couple of game changer books for me or mentioned in my book. One is Marshall Goldsmith's What Got You There Won't Get You, or What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Yeah. I encourage people to read that on a regular basis because you're always accumulating certain skills or 
Um, and, and, and those skills might be serving you in the moment. And five years from now, you're, that skill might not be serving you anymore and you have to set it aside. It's not that it's a bad thing in the moment and that people have people struggle with that. Mm-hmm. I also, one of the books that was a catalyst for me early, early on um, was um, Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking. Mm-hmm. So um, that, that can serve you in so many ways in your life. Um, just trying to find the good edge in everything. What's good about this? I mean, we even did that in COVID, believe it or not. That was a pause moment for my leadership team and, and I. Um, so that, there's, there's a couple right there um, that I really appreciate that have been, I, that are kind of go, I go to. What's your idea of perfect happiness? Um, so that, it would be, if I answered it in, my, in a curt way, you wouldn't understand it. So, um, because people would misunderstand what I'm saying. Um, but at the end of the day, happiness is a choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So perfect happiness is learning to be happy where you are when you're there. I love and that. And then magically happiness comes because you're happy. Now that is also research driven. You want to be happy. Don't be looking for something to happy to smile, smile, and you'll be happy. Those oh, same so endorphins are released in your brain. If you would just smile, it'll all work out. Yep. What is one mental health strategy for managing hard days? Um, well, so much of what we just talked about is the case. Yeah. You know, just pause, breathe. Mm-hmm. Really? How bad is this? Really? Yeah. Is it? Is it going to is- matter? And is it going to matter in five days, five years? Is it going to matter? Break it down. And um, try to think about is, is, is my higher stress level or anger or what, how, whatever emotion you as a leader choose to respond in something like that, is that going to help or hurt the problem? Okay. I like that. If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> If you had to describe your outlook in one quick motto, what would it be? It's all going to be all right. Oh, I love that. I love that, Sharon. Well, this has been so fun. And for our audience that might want to pick up a copy of your book, Stories and Heart, where can they do that? They can go to Amazon.com or Walmart.com, Target.com, Barnesandnobles.com. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and pretty soon here, uh, it will be available in bookstores um, in February. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Sharon, this has been so fun. I'm going to have to get my daughter over to build a bear. We're going to build a bear for her seventh birthday. And what? I just really appreciate you being here today. Thank you for having me. It was really fun, Blake. All right, everybody, you've been listening to the Modern Customer Podcast. Pick up a copy of Sharon's book, Stories and Heart. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time.